This is the time of year when I really enjoy talking about the year that was and to try and give you some uh, glimpse into our shared future. This is the start of our 48th academic year and we're now just three short years away from celebrating our 50th anniversary. And today's events obviously include uh, the State of the College, but our first staff art exhibit, and I'm really pleased for them, and also the second annual Festival of Flavors. Uh, it proved so popular last year that people asked that we do it again. And Punch Brothers are here visiting us with their contemporary bluegrass. Well, after nine years, I finally had a few moments this summer, and I cleaned out my office. And going through photographs and papers, I found the information guide that the college provided for students in our third academic year in 1967. Of course, in those days, we were the youngest institution in the Claremont Consortium and the second women's college to be established. Flipping through its pages was a little bit like visiting the set of Mad Men. <laughs> Clouds of bouffant hair, men in suits, and everyone smoking. Sometimes we imagine that the Woodstock nation had its start at Pitzer, that Jimi Hendrix wrote our school song. Uh, just for the record, we don't have a school song. And that bell bottoms and tie-dye uh, were always in style. However, that's not necessarily true. Our roots, in fact, are much more conventional. Pitzer's founding trustees did, after all, establish a women's college right across the street from a men's college. Read into that what you like. But the roots of a tree planted in the right place at the right time with just the right amount of nutrients create something really stunning and beautiful. And Pitzer has grown over the years. The progressive leadership of our founding president, John Atherton, and our 11 founding faculty, together with the first year matriculating class of young women who were enrolled in Pitzer in 1967, were drawn into the cultural revolutions of the late 60s and the early 70s, and they and the institution they designed together were permanently changed. Just think about it for a moment. In an educational landscape dominated by the Ivy Leagues, what other faculty or students of that era would have embraced the chance to be part of this brand new liberal arts college in Southern California named after a citrus industry executive with a $2 million endowment. That's gutsy. Only those with big imaginations and even bigger dreams for the future. We may have been founded by folks with rather conventional ideas, but with the, within the first year, we were dedicated to shared governance, interdisciplinary teaching, and social change, something that is distinctive in higher education even today. Now, the incoming class of 71 was greeted with this message from Charlotte D. Elmont, professor of educational psychology and dean of the college, informing students about college life and expectations. Says Professor Elmont, you will be free to attend the classes of your choice, and therefore your choices must be made carefully and wisely. You will be free to challenge the ways of society, both at Pitzer and outside its walls, and there you must be wise in your challenges, thoughtful about their impl implications and responsible for their outcomes. Students were also thoughtfully provided with clothing tips for living in the high desert. <laughs> this afternoon, I'd like to indulge in a bit of nostalgia and spend some time flipping through what amounts to the Pitzer community photo album so we can see who we were, where we've been, and where we appear to be going. Yes, I like the closet cramming. <laughs> Long an issue. While the campus was still under construction in 1967, we had come a long way from how we initially looked in May 1963, which was nothing. So in 67, we actually finally had something, uh, but we had a great deal of work yet to do. Even then, we had a lot of bike racks on campus. Times were much simpler then on the Pitzer campus with three academic buildings and two residence halls. Although true to our motto, mindful of the future, there were plans underway to build McConnell Dining Hall. Pitzer students then ate at CMC Scripps and Mud. And a fourth academic building, Avery, and a third residence hall, Mead. 
These were the years before Reggae Fest and Kahootek, and so live performances occurred on a much smaller scale. <laughs> and apparently you had to wear a white dinner jacket. Uh, <laughs> The 60s was the decade when Governor Pat Brown's California Master Plan for Higher Education went into effect and the CSU system was founded. Over the course of the 60s, campuses were constructed, faculty hired, and a greater portion of state and federal funding was dedicated to increasing access for students. Pitzer is a product of Pomona President James Blaisdell's group plan, as the Claremont College's plan was called, and it is also representative of that era's investment in higher education. The boom times for higher education, however, have come dramatically to a halt. Many institutions have adopted marketing techniques befitting used car salesmen rather than colleges and universities. And as students look for bargains and guarantees, they've fallen victim to these same consumerist attitudes. Instead of earning a degree, they're racking up debt. Last year, there were tuition increases of over 40% for various CSUs and double-digit increases for the UCs. This coming year, UC will receive 40% of the state appropriations it received in 1990. In California, state schools comprise 10 universities, 23 colleges, and 112 community colleges, totaling more than 3 million students. Of the highly selective liberal arts colleges in California, and there are six, meaning those who accept fewer than 50% of those who apply, the total national liberal arts college population wouldn't fill the USC Coliseum. We're talking about less than 90,000 students. In total, the undergraduate colleges of the Claremont Consortium enroll this year 5,200 students. As Angel Perez, interim vice president for admissions, pointed out last year in his op-ed piece, waiting for the incredible Hulk, of the students who enter college in America, 43% don't graduate, and those who do typically don't complete in four years. We have a for-profit college sector that preys on low-income and first-generation students who are not savvy about college application and the financial aid process. These schools have produced the highest student loan default rate in the country and among the lowest graduation rates in the nation. Access for students is the number one issue facing higher education today. And today in the United States, there is greater student loan debt than credit card debt. This year, 44% of Pitzer students will receive some form of financial aid. And the amount of aid offered to students this year totals $17 million. Pitzer meets 100% of every student's demonstrated financial need, and we're committed to reducing the average amount of indebtedness of our students. Indeed, this is a goal in our five-year tactical plan. In the past five years, we've increased our per-student contribution to financial aid by nearly 50%, and this is money that students will never have to pay back. Upon graduation, our students owe 20% less than the national average. Our freshman class is very impressive this year, and they come from 10 countries. Our yield was 30%. Uh, the year before, it was 27%, so we've increased there. Our selectivity this year was 24%, and the year before that, it was 25%. So we also have strengthened there slightly. Our total FTE this fall is 999. Our, our point three. Our maximum is 1,000 within Claremont, so we're right under the measure. In this decidedly uncertain climate, with 14 million unemployed and unemployment at 9% plus, the decline in the stock market and a depressed housing market, conversely, Pitzer is holding strong with an expanding faculty, strengthened fundraising, new and greatly improved facilities, this is one, strong admissions, increased retention, and new pro programs on the horizon. Our decision to suspend endowment spending two years ago was very wise, and actually we were the only college or university in the country who was able to do that. And we did that in order to protect the corpus of our endowment. And we wanted to position ourselves for the market rebound, and it was nice while it lasted. Let's hope it comes around again. The college has come far since its beginning. Note the lovely cardboard construction of our academic quad. And we're still growing. 
our largest and most expensive construction project to date is the $33 million four lead platinum 100 thousand square foot mixed usage residence halls and that project is on budget and on target thanks to Larry Burek and Yuet Lee and I expect that we will hit our completion date of June 2012. Assuming we reach this benchmark this will allow time for move-in over the summer for such areas as the intercollegiate media studies program and the Mossbacher Gartrell Center for Media Experimentation and Activism, the Institute for Global Local Study, the Offices of Study Abroad, faculty offices, two visiting faculty apartments, and 308 student rooms, which will allow us to house 85% of Pitzer students on campus. So we're not looking to grow the overall size of our student population, we just want more students living on campus. We're expecting that these new residence halls will result in Pitzer's having the most sustainable campus in the country. I'm pleased that we just received the 2010 Excellence in Design Award from the City of Claremont for our Benson Auditorium, and in fact, this is the second award that we've won from the city. The first was for the first phase of our residence halls. Over the summer, facilities also installed a lovely new elevator in McConnell Center. Now for the first time in Pitzer's history, the Founders Room will be accessible via central elevator in the lobby instead of in the back. And for those of us who've been around for a while, this is indeed a good, good moment. And an atrium skylight installed on the second floor will enable year-round usage of that space and prevent leaking into the cafeteria. Always nice. <laughs> and after many, many exchanges with the fire department, the modular science complex finally received its sign-off this summer and fall classes are well underway. I'm also pleased to report that Pitzer is just a few $100,000 away from a deep renovation of the Gold Student Center. With so many students now being located around the Gold Student Center, its facilities need to be expanded. And Pitzer's Green Bike Program has received capital funding to expand their quarters into the new residence hall space. The Writing Center also received a much needed paint job and furniture upgrade, and the courtyard area in front of the Writing Center, Career Services, and Campus has really been enlarged and greatly beautified. Another major planning project this past year was the Redford Conservancy. This initiative, this is not how it's going to look. Uh, this is actually how it looked many, many years ago. This initiative has taken great effort on the part of all of our constituency groups. And I'd like to thank in particular Professor Paul Falstich for his leadership uh, in this area and for his sage advice. And at this point, we're actually slightly ahead of where I thought we would be by uh, the end of last year. After submitting a proposal for nine acres, we were actually granted permission to purchase 12 by the Claremont University Consortium, exactly where we wanted them, contiguous with the Bernard Field Station. And upon successful parceling, the Bernard Field Station will be made permanent, something that we have long worked for and aspired to. At this point, I'm cautiously optimistic about our chances of success. We have a major donor, and now we're just uh, determining the final price of that acreage with the Claremont University Consortium. And speaking of completed projects, for the last several years, the college has been under review by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. This effort was led by Dean Allen Jones and involved the entire campus community. Obviously, the visit last March went very, very well, and we have now been accredited for the maximum eight-year period. There are many exciting things on the horizon for us, and new students are being shaped by the unique curriculum we offer. In fact, students have been transformed since our beginning, as is evident in this picture of Deborah Deutsch Smith, <laughs> class of 1968, emerita trustee who was selected alumna of the year last spring, and her friends at a debutante party the year prior to her coming to Pitzer. By 1967, students looked just a little bit different. Now, I look at these photographs the way people used to stare at the first color television sets. I'm fascinated by them, and yet I feel no direct relationship to them. To their credit, the Pitzer of 1967, very progressive for its time, laid the foundation for the inclusive and vibrant institution we are today. But while some things change quite a bit, other things don't. 
our students are still intellectually talented, imaginative, and even in those days, presidents were active fundraisers. <laughs> Here they are, the Claremont presidents of 1967, working the phones and smoking, working the phones and smoking. Uh, there's a certain similarity, uh, I think you might note, and here are the presidents today. Uh, about 25% of presidents in the United States are female college and university presidents. Yet here in Claremont, we number 75%. And so that is indeed a great change over 67. And we partner together in various aspects, but still remain autonomous and competitive as individual institutions. And speaking of money, financial security is what has and will continue to ensure our success. Pitzer ended the fiscal year with an operating surplus and the 2011-12 budget is balanced with two-thirds of normal endowment spending. Our tuition increased 3.5% as compared to 4.6% nationally. The budget provides for salary increases for faculty and staff and also fully funded the employer's contribution increase in the benefit plans. I'm very pleased that our endowment continues to grow, and as of June 30th, it totaled over 113 million, a new record high. And we earned 19.5% on our investments last year, also good. Advancement had an excellent year, positioning us well for our kickoff in the spring for our next campaign. This year's senior class designated that their gift for the Friends of Luke Rogers International Program Fund be matched by the family, which they did, and they actually raised a record amount, uh, a stunning $70,000. Uh, this is a record for all of the five colleges, and I commend uh, Advancement for their work on our students' behalf. Faculty and staff participation in the annual fund was 91%, with a total of 45 thousand dollars raised. For the fifth year in a row, we are ranked number one in the country for faculty and staff participation in the annual fund. And I just want to thank you for that. Over the last eight years, total contributions have increased by 55 percent. In addition, the Parent Leadership Council established the Internship Fund in 2010 to ensure that Pitzer College students, regardless of their financial situation, would have the opportunity to participate in an internship linking their academic studies with career exploration. Many students, especially the 44% of our students who come here on financial aid, are unable to take advantage of internships because many of them are unpaid. Cody Clock, class of 2012, was one of our recipients last year. And as a dual major in economics and psychology, she had a wonderful opportunity to intern at the U.S. State Department's East Asia Pacific Bureau in Washington, D.C. Without this internship, she would have una been unable to take advantage of that opportunity. Thanks to the generosity of many parents and alumni, 12 students received a paid internship last year, and their goal is that 35 students will have paid internships this coming summer, and their goal is $100,000. In the 60s, just like the presidents, board of trustees also looked very different. Here are our first trustees, talking and smoking, and here are our trustees as they look today. The total number on the board is currently 37, with the following composition, alumni 32%, parents 38%, friends 30%. The trustees are committed to Pitzer's vision for providing for the future, and they are actively involved in philanthropy and governance. This was a productive year for academic affairs with dedicated teaching, advising, and scholarly contributions. Faculty garnered national media attention, including an online book published by Professor Alex Juhas, titled Learning from YouTube, and Professors Judith Grabner, Mary Hatcher Skears, Jesse Lerner, and emeritus professor Ronald McCauley also published books. Two of the college's most respected and beloved faculty retired this year, professors Steve Glass and Jose Calderon. And today we honor the long and distinguished lives of emeriti professors Dorothea Yale, professor of German, and Bob Albert, professor of psychology. We also lost Virginia Atherton, 
wife of John Atherton, the college's first president. And until the day she died, she continued to love and care deeply about her college. This is a photograph of her and President Atherton with R.K. Pitzer, the college's founder, and his wife, Ines Scott Pitzer, after which Scott Hall is named. For the past eight years, Pitzer has been, per thousand students, number one in the United States for Fulbright Fellowships. For the past two years, we have been number one in the sheer total of Fulbrights among liberal arts colleges. Last fall, I visited Alan Goodman, CEO and president of the Fulbright Foundation, and he informed me that he considered Pitzer the Pitzer, uh, the poster child for Fulbright fellowships. 19 Fulbrights were awarded to Pitzer students and one alumna this year, with an astonishing 9% of our graduating class receiving Fulbrights. Smith came in second with 19, and Pomona received 18. I will not comment on that. <laughs> and I would like to take a moment for us to recognize and to thank Professor Nigel, Nigel Boyle for all of his efforts on behalf of Pitzer students as well as Sandy. So let's thank them. Last year, a total of 157 Pitzer students studied abroad in 27 countries. In addition, 94 international students studied here from 30 countries. And I would also like to express my appreciation to members of the Office of Study Abroad for all of your efforts on behalf of both our matriculating students as well as our visiting students. Thank you. Also, the name of the Joint Science Department was changed this past year to the W.M. Keck Science Department, and science classes are now being offered on both sides of Mills Avenue. In the past 10 years, the number of Pitzer students enrolling in science classes has doubled, the largest increase among the Keck Science Department colleges. Also over the past eight years, the college has seen a generation of faculty retire and the student-faculty ratio reduced from 12 to 1 to 11 to 1, and the goal within our five-year tactical plan is 10 to 1. In the period since 2001, 2002, through the end of the last academic year, Pitzer will have hired 27 new tenure-track faculty. Seven of these hires represent new lines at the college, and 20 of these represent replacement lines. For the academic year, this coming academic year, Pitzer maintains its record 71 faculty members. New faculty hired in the last nine years represent 41% of current Pitzer faculty, which gives you some idea of the generational change that we've been experiencing. To the best of our knowledge, Pitzer is the only liberal arts college to achieve faculty gender parity, as well as having the most diverse faculty and administration of any liberal arts college in the country. And I think that is quite a fine achievement. Three searches were successfully concluded this past year. In English and World Literature, Melissa Hildalgo from UC San Diego, and in Media Studies, Ruti Talmor from New York University. The Keck Science Department conducted three searches, in Cell and Molecular Biology, Brian Thines from Washington State University, and in Climate Science, Branwyn Williams from the Ohio State University. Keck also hired Aaron LeConte, who does not look like that, um, <laughs> from the Scripps Institute in Biochemistry, who will actually begin in the fall of next year because he has received uh, a fellowship. And Todd Hanma, who does not look like that, uh, is actually from UCLA in the Asian American Studies, and he will join us next fall. He also received a very prestigious Chancellor's Postdoctoral uh, Fellowship at UC San Diego, and so we will meet him in another year. This will be a very, very busy year for faculty searches, and I have just listed all of them here for you. And uh, I'm really excited about the expanding number of faculty that we have and the new opportunities this represents for us in terms of developing new curriculum for our students. And so I turn now to the library. 
consistent with the reorganization plan outlined in a letter from the Academic Deans Committee to the Presidents last summer, the Academic Deans began meeting in double sessions this fall to create a new organizational structure that will direct the reporting relationship of the library to the Academic Deans rather than directly to CUC. This plan much more effectively will link the academic strategic planning efforts on each of the campuses with the infrastructure for supporting academic needs of the library for the future. It also creates, creates a coherent basis for budget allocation during program reviews in the context of WASC accreditation. I anticipate that the Dean's discussion of the new reporting relationship will be taking place throughout this semester and they'll be soliciting input from faculty groups across the consortium. The Office of Student Affairs had an active year, starting with our first year Pitzer Student Orientation Adventure Program. This past year, the program offered 17 different trips throughout Southern California, ranging from sailing to hiking, camping, surfing, to studying arts and sustainability in the food culture in Los Angeles. I like that trip. Uh, this is a largely student-run program, and I'd like to commend the student leaders who are involved, as well as Drew Herbert, who has provided staff support. Pitzer students were involved in over 55 different clubs on campus last year. We had a revitalized student senate, and across the Claremont colleges, students had memberships in over 100 different clubs. This was also an extremely active year for our community engagement center, where Pitzer students again committed over 100,000 hours working in the region. Jumpstart has now joined the center, and we have partnerships with such organizations as the Pomona Economic Opportunity Center, Uncommon Good, and Pomona Habla. Under the leadership of Tessa Hicks and Martha Barsanis, I'd like to recognize their many contributions and thank them. And then there is our Green Bike Program, a student-run organization over a decade old. In contrast to the state of environmentalism in the mid-60s, when being green meant not tossing your aluminum beer can out of the car window when you drove home in your V8, the Green Bike Program is actually a place where students reuse old bikes and parts, giving community members free access to bicycle tools and repair lessons. And this is just one example of the leadership that our students display, as well as how they can make global changes through immediate local political action. Last year, 133 Pitzer students participated in varsity athletics, and 45 joined club sports. Senior David Colvin, a pitcher for the Sage Hens, was named to the All Skyak team and drafted by the Seattle Mariners. And senior Jacob Karen, starting quarterback for the football team, was named the Skyak MVP, a first in school history. As we rise in the ranks and attract more positive media attention, it's sometimes hard to believe just how young Pitzer College is in the national fabric of national liberal arts institutions. In 1968, we had 16 graduates who represented our first full graduating class. Last year, 244 students walked across the stage at our Stephen Glass Commencement Plaza. While nearly five decades have passed since our founding and our physical appearance has changed a great deal, we've changed the least in the most meaningful of ways. The work that we perform is of the greatest importance, and as the debate about higher education becomes more strident, it's crucial that we all understand how vital our role is in providing the finest model of a distinctive liberal arts education. In the collegiate learning assessment given to students in their first and fourth years of college, one result was that students majoring in the liberal arts fields showed greater improvement than students majoring in non-liberal arts fields in the areas of critical thinking, analytical reasoning, problem solving, and writing. 60% of American college students are not liberal arts majors. And the number one major in America is business. Business majors actually scored the lowest and improved the least on this survey. Only 22% of bachelor's degrees today are awarded in the liberal arts, and our graduates are needed more than ever. 
This past year, Pitzer was positively ranked by a number of media outlets. Two such measures of our merit, we were named by the Princeton Review's the best 368 colleges and included for the second year by Campus Compact on the President's Higher Education Community Service Honor Roll. This year we were also ranked 42nd, the highest in our history by U.S. News. And while there's great debate about the importance and accuracy of U.S. News, it's also worth noting that no other college has risen as far and as quickly as Pitzer, and we are also the youngest college to, to attain this particular ranking. And you can add to the rankings list this year that we are the most service-oriented, most activist, happiest, and have the best food, although I was a little disappointed that Harvey Mudd beat us in the best weather ranking in Newsweek. <laughs> I emailed Maria Clawway and I said, clearly that's because we're so much farther east. <laughs> so I'd like to thank this opportunity to express my gratitude to all of the 200 staff of Pitzer College. For 48 years, staff have been straightening out our paper jams getting our mailings out, creating beautiful gardens and grounds, cooking the best food in higher education, creating PowerPoint presentations, <laughs> making sound and lighting systems work, and keeping the heating and cooling systems running. And from the start, faculty have been the heart of the college. Faculty created the governance system, program of instruction, and our interdisciplinary philosophy. Time and time again, I hear alumni from our earliest classes to our most recent graduates tell me that they have been utterly transformed by their Pitzer experience. And I'm very, very fortunate to work with a very talented group of administrators who comprise the President's Cabinet. This year is a very special one for one particular dean, Alan Jones. <laughs> Ah, uh, this is pre-dean, the pre-dean days, uh, <laughs> who after 12 remarkable, productive, and talented years is, at the end of this year, returning to the faculty. Please join me in thanking him for his service. <laughs> and here is my vice presidential team, Yuet Lee, Jim. <laughs> Jim Marchant, Anna Chang, Adrian Stevens, and Angel Perez. They're thrilled. They haven't seen this slide before. <laughs> and finally, the nine years that I've been president of Pitzer College have gone by very, very quickly. And I measure the passage of time by looking at the door frame of the president's residence, where I've been measuring my son since he was barely six years old. The pencil marks are now over my head, and my son is a high school sophomore. And this past year taught me a great deal about loss and the beauty of support as I grappled with losing my father in November and my best friend in May. I've spent time thinking about the difference between nostalgia and grief. And what I have realized is that grief is a real measurement of actual loss. Grief's a, cartog a cartographer mapping out gaps and holes in our new psychic terrain. And it has been an interesting journey for me traveling that new terrain. Nostalgia, on the other hand, imagines the loss of something that often we might not have ever had. Popular culture currently imagines the 60s as having what one New York Times writer calls an enviable luster. Women in the 60s of current popular cultural imagination we're happy in pencil skirts and bunny costumes. Poverty and racism appear only as subplots. The country seemed to enjoy the glamorous, uncomplicated pleasures of being American. There appears to be uh, a deliberate eliding of the most critical issues during that time. The war against poverty, the Civil Rights Act, the Wilderness Act, the founding of the United Farm Workers, and the feminist movement. We all know that this is a fiction reflecting the anxieties of the time in which we live. As I look over these images of Pitzer then and now, I'm so grateful for our present. With all its complexity and despite all of its challenges, Pitzer College is a much finer institution, much more engaged with the messy problems of the world 
than its first graduating classes ever could have imagined. This is a new year, and I'm very excited about what's ahead. This is the first year of our five-year tactical plan. I'm very much enjoying round three of teaching with Stu McConnell. Uh, this time, we're teaching the Gilded Age. And I'm also looking forward to beginning a new writing project. Now, this presentation, believe me, would not have been possible without the help of my assistant, Lindsay Taylor. And I'm also grateful for the help of Lori Babcock, Joe Dixon, Jason Rivera, Veronica Moy, and Naomi Ortega. So please join me in thanking them for their assistance. And as always, I am honored to be part of the Pitzer College community, and thank you so much for the privilege of serving as your president. And so now, let's eat, dance, and enjoy ourselves. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>